Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Thanks to everyone who supported the March for the Food Bank last week. Woo! If you thought that was a bonkers fundraising event, wait until you hear about the hot chocolate run for Safe Passage happening this weekend in Northampton. We'll introduce you to the creators of the event and some of the people at Safe Passage who are working towards safety, healing, and justice for everyone in our community who has experienced domestic violence. But first... On Mondays, we usually talk with Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, oh, yes. but we're bumping him to Wednesday because over the weekend, I got a hot tip from our resident word nerd, Emily Brewster, resident wordster from Merriam-Webster, that Merriam-Webster's word of the year would be announced on Monday. Emily Brewster, a little bit under the weather, so she brought in a excellent substitute to talk to us a about ringer is what we call we'll this call him a ringer for sure <laughs> any pm's own and Merriam webster's own peter sokolowski first off i love when you say jazz at eight at the end of your promos all <laughs> he the says time. it I, I say it while we're live in the studio and our pro the promo <laughs> runs during our show yeah he, he says it while the promo's going and then we just wait for you to say it and it's kind of delightful <laughs> it really, it's, it's, it's probably so, always the same pace or yes, whatever. Yeah. It is. It's, it's so it's smooth amazing. i don't think about it <laughs> it, ma- it makes it seem like this jazz is something i'm not going to miss just like we're not going to miss oh, good. the day of the announcement of Merriam-Webster's, I almost called it Emily Brewster's, word of the year. So before we hear what the word of the year is... Because both of us have managed to avoid spoilers all day. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. Um, how does the word of the year get picked? Well, it comes but once a year, <laughs> first of <laughs> it's all. It's the Santa Claus of words. Um, when two dictionaries and, you know, and builders um, love each other very much. Right, right, right. <laughs> and this is an anniversary year because the first word of the year that we announced was 2003. Ah. So this is the 20th anniversary, the, I guess the 21st word if you count them all. Um, and that's because by that time we had become more familiar with the data created by the dictionary online. For 400 years, English language dictionaries were in print and there was no possible way for the people who published dictionaries to know which words were being looked up. Mm -hmm. And once the dictionary went online, we suddenly had all this data and we didn't necessarily know what to do with it. (laughs) Um, And it took a few years, but what we recognized was what we have here is a measure of curiosity, uh, the curiosity of a culture. And with 100 million page views a month, it's a big story. It becomes a kind of one of these questions of big data. Um, And what we do is we compare what we learned over the years is that there are problems of the English language that don't go away. Right. (laughs) And therefore are words in the dictionary that are going to be looked up day in, day out, year in, year out, that will tell us a lot about English, but nothing about 2023. Uh So we have to filter that, what we call the evergreen words. We filter those words out. They tend to be... affect, effect. Affect and effect, problems of the English language. um, The EI problems. uh, I before E, those those words uh, tend (laughs) to... To be high, but also there are a number of words that, that are uh, that I would categorize of, as words that are abstract words from Greek and Latin roots: integrity, paradigm, conundrum, ubiquitous. That those are the kinds of words, vocabulary words. We, and you might even we might call them SAT words. Yeah. Um, the kinds of words you study for a test. They really do have a, a profile. And so what we have to do is remove those from the equation and look at year over year which words rise to the top. Um, and and part of that is, again, because it's such big data, 500,000 entries in the dictionary is a very long tail. And there may be a word, as was the case this year, that rises to the top that wasn't a number one lookup on any single day, but was a higher lookup on the 365 day period um, and to push a word to the top like that sometimes uh, is a huge spike and sometimes is a small spike because that depends on where the word starts. Mm -hmm. So in this case this year, that's the story. In, in, In other words, the rising tide that that lifts all boats. So not a spike in lookups for this one particular word surrounding one particular current event, but everything in 2023 has been the slow burn build to what the 2023 word of the year is, according to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. The tortoise in this word race, if you would. (laughs) Yes, as chosen by you, because you looked it up this much more in 2023 over 2022. Peter Sokolowski from NEPM and from Merriam-Webster. What is... Merriam-Webster's 2023 Word of the Year. Uh, Merriam-Webster's Word of the Year for 2023 is authentic. Oh! oh. <laughs> yeah. why, why is that funny, first? Um, because there's, especially, like, so I think listeners of this show will have realized that I am a giant foodie no, in no small part because I used to work in kitchens. Mm-hmm. And so, especially there... 
and in other things of cultural sensitivity, authenticity is a big point of conversation Absolutely. and contention. And so for this to be a word that is is steadily looked up throughout the year is no real surprise. It's just kind of interesting that that's the one that rose to the top. I have a feeling it will show up again. <laughs> well, <laughs> according to Merriam-Webster's big data crunching, what do you think, Peter Sokolowski, propelled the slow burn of authenticity in 2023 over other years? This is not a word that is hard to understand. I think a nope. lot of people who are native English speakers know what authentic means. So what was it that caused it? Can you tell from the data? Uh, well, first of all, we're good at reading data. We're, we're not good at reading minds. We <laughs> always say that. Um, but I think there are a few takeaways. And it's I'm glad to have a few more than a few more minutes than usual to <laughs> to explain it, because it, it, it doesn't seem like a logical word uh, that would stand out from from the past year. We have had words of the year that that really jump at us, like the word pandemic, right? The word vaccine, yes. Um, and those were clearly one word does encapsulate <laughs> the the experience of those particular years. <laughs> then we've also had words like the word integrity. Once was the word of the year. Um, the word science or the word democracy. Those have all been words of the year. Also, this authentic uh, word of the year authentic, um, is like the word integrity in that it is a quality that we value. Um, and it's also an abstract quality that is therefore hard to define. But it's also true that we are living right now in what I would call a crisis of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And when we question authenticity, that means that we value it more. Um, and in this case, we have a couple of stories that were over uh, the entire year, um, stories that came back again and again, notably artificial intelligence, yeah. AI. Um, and that is, is essentially a question of authenticity. Um, do we believe our own eyes or our own ears? Um, we've, li we've been living through a time of a crisis of truth and facts, alternative facts uh, and um, uh, the, the, the kind of questioning of authority and of news sources uh, and of our, our leaders. Um, and we've been so th I think as a culture, we've been primed for this kind of uh, uh, assertion of authenticity. But there are other things, too. And in fact, Khalees, you mentioned that words that are closely associated with the words, the word authentic include cuisine and uh, dish, but also the authentic self, the uh -huh. authentic voice. And we found, for example, Taylor Swift had a posting, uh, she's using her authentic voice or finding her authentic voice. Elon Musk um, said that he valued uh, social media postings that were, quote, authentic. Um, and so it's used in these different ways to mean un without intermediary. Uh, and I think that is something that speaks to the culture in a broad way, not just without intermediary of ideas. Um, but think of the way that we are living now um, in small food movements. Um, we're living in a kind of golden age of small batch. It could be whiskey. It could be There are more microbreweries now than there were gas stations. You know, when I when I was a kid, um, but also, I mean, I just th think of the things you're interested in. Um, if you like road bicycles, um, there are often sh shops that make them uh, in small numbers that that you, that you can you know customize for yourself. Um, musical instruments, guitars, trumpets. In my case, um, I often think of oh, these are actually kind of small. They're not the big GM factory model. They're the small model that appeals to a smaller population. Um, and we're living through a period where uh, because the internet has, has sort of made uh, us, uh, uh, because the internet has made everything more easily accessible and easy to find, we seek the real thing. I think it's fascinating. We're speaking with Peter Sokolowski from NEPM, who hosts Jazz a la Mode at 8 and 9. <laughs> depending on which day of the week, uh, and is also from Merriam-Webster about the word of the year, which was announced today. The word of the year is authentic. And we had a conversation not too long ago that we re-aired last week about uh, the resurgence of vinyl records and I record stores. That's another, uh, you know, the influence of the Internet, which is amorphous and not touchable to the idea that you can and will buy Taylor Swift, again, her new record, uh, multiple times yep. to have a physical copy of it that might be a different color, might have different True. accoutrements associated with it to have an actual authentic artifact as opposed to the ephemeral that the internet brings. Yeah, I mean, just anything from like leather shoes and the way they're, you know, if they're actually stitched, that means you can have them repaired. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we value that kind of thing more than when I was a kid. And uh, and I think this word does speak to that. And, and, and uh, you know, 
we're, we also have to recognize the SAG after strike was a huge story oh, this right. year, and that was about the authenticity of their 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 actual identity. Um, that was, um, will AI capture their image and render their career obsolete? These are big questions. Mm-hmm. I think it also like speaks to some of the content of that too. I'm thinking of how there are more culturally sensitive work that are coming out like that provides a little bit more of that layer of authenticity that 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 shortness of space between like you and the subject matter in a way that is more real and more visceral like in in no small way like reservation dogs is is a perfect example of this explain why uh well because the creative team and the actors on screen are all indigenous or first nations folks so there's something to like stories like that that are being put out into the world that allows a broadening of everybody's understanding of that culture mm-hmm. in a way that I think relates to this yeah, absolutely because I mean we just said there's a crisis of truth a crisis of auth- authenticity there's also uh, a, an awareness of identity and mm-hmm. a crisis of identity that goes it speaks to pronouns in the in the language um, and uh, identifying um, uh, uh, whether it be gender or um, racial heritage uh, cultural heritage, uh, and it can be as simple as the oh, sort of old French cuisine was always the fancy cuisine. Now what we want is the village cuisine, you know. Yes. We want it. And so, I mean, <laughs> oh, that's more authentic because this is what the you know what the what the farmers eat. Um, but that we laugh, but it's also true, mm-hmm. you know. And then hearkening back to what our uh, f- local hero author Grace Lin bringing an authentic cookbook of Chinese food, yes. saying what is authentic, what makes for authentic? Is yeah. it just because it was done in the old country this way that it's authentic, or is this new American version of Chinese food actually authentic? Yeah, yeah the, the the argument about like American Chinese being its own thing, right. like like it's it's a constant conversation about third culture and like how this is its own thing and like burgeoning out, like where is where does authenticity sit within that too? Really cool. Well, and Monty, <laughs> what you just brought up brings to mind something else, which is that authentic is what brands and influencers and celebrities aspire to have and to embody. And the fact is, there are apps like Be Real oh that my. show mm. your actual. Oh, this is not a curated in, uh, in, environment. This is the this is where I am right at this moment. Yeah. And and are you going to reciprocally share where you are? The, the, it was all about authenticity. And that what's interesting is that for bigger brands. Um, they value the gold standard now is uh, is authentic content creators. There's someone who looks like they actually use this product, um, who's uh, speaking about it on it could be TikTok or Instagram, and that's what's interesting. There's an irony here because authenticity becomes a performance at mm-hmm. that point, and that you touched on that already. And the fact is, we have to we're more aware, and if you'll permit me to say, in a kind of postmodern way, we're more aware of that type of performance now than ever before. It's not the Betty Crocker commercials. Right. Um, it's we want to see, oh, I actually use this kind of sugar or, you know, whatever. Um, and that speaks to, again, authenticity it takes us right back to the same word. I also think that authenticity is what is the appeal of Donald Trump. Even though yeah. he is not truthful, he comes across to many as authentic. He's Absolutely. somebody who sh- shoots from the hip. He speaks exactly what's on his mind at any given time. Yep. So this could be a little bit of I a mean, canary in a coal mine for what may go on into the year 2024. I feel like he's authentic to a something. Right. <laughs> and he's definitely no, no. being true to himself. Yeah. No, but again, as a performance of authenticity, it's yeah. clearly valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, it, it, that also connects next to why this word. Uh, last year with gaslighting, what was interesting is that, that is was the a word term, of the year last year. That was mm-hmm. the word of the year last year. And that speaks also to, to be deception. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting is that our citations show that it's used by both sides mm-hmm. uh, politically. It's used as often on Fox News as it is used on uh, MSNBC. Mm-hmm. And there is another there's another point here, which is that this is a word that is used um, by both sides of the spectrum. And that's important, too. Mm-hmm. Peter Sokolowski from NEPM and from Merriam-Webster for our purposes today, because today is the day Merriam-Webster has announced the word of the year, authenticity. Can we hear how Merriam-Webster, our dictionary in Springfield, defines the word of the year, authenticity? Uh, Sure. I mean, uh, if I were to, I'm just going to look at the... um, Because uh, Peter does not have the dictionary memorized. (laughs) That would be insane. Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, there think... are some I can cite, but not everyone. <laughs> um, and authentic you know, is a great word. It comes from Latin and French. But uh, since one, not false or imitation. And those are syn- there are synonyms, the synonyms real and actual. 
apply to that meaning, not false or imitation. Sense two, true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. Mm -hmm. The word of the year. The irony of this authentic word being the word of the year, it's not lost on me that it was a digital propulsion of virtual zeros and ones that <laughs> pushed authentic to the top <laughs> with the data that we can derive from our dictionary. That data so is goes, very real. <laughs> yes. And that is indeed how the word of the year is picked, not by uh, large publicity stunts that may exist authentically in Springfield. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Peter Sokolowski, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be here. Happy New Year for happy word of the year. <laughs> <laughs> happy word of the year to you. <laughs> Next week on the show, hopefully with our resident wordster, Emily Brewster, we'll talk about some of the runners up for word of the year, which are always a fascinating linguistic glimpse at a year's worth of current events. Up next, we'll learn about the origins of the hot chocolate run celebrating its 20th year in Northampton this Sunday. And we'll hear about the work of Safe Passage, which the hot chocolate run supports. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. <laughs> Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. This Sunday is perhaps the largest and most beloved fundraiser of the year in The Fabulous 413. It is the 20th anniversary of the hot chocolate run for Safe Passage. The hot chocolate run is as old as word of the year. That's right. 20 years, two <laughs> decades. It's crazy to think about it. Later, we'll be joined by Catherine Hodes, Director of D Community Programs, and Natalie Elrich, Director of Development, to talk about the work of Safe Passage. And joining us to give us the origin stories, like the MCU, the backstory of the, of the hot chocolate run for Safe Passage, in this crazy bonkers weird, fun community event that started 20 years ago are three of the, the originators of the event. Jen Derringer, who professionally works for Community Legal Aid, who's doing their own fundraising this week because they're trying to make sure everybody can get fair legal representation. John Fry, who is married to Jen Derringer and has autographed every gas pump and scale in the city of Northampton, Hadley, which other cities? Hadley, Amherst, East Hampton, South Hadley. He is the sealer of weights and measures. If that doesn't sound like a crazy <laughs> medieval honorific of some sort, I don't know what does. And the now, I think, legendary, beloved cartoonist behind Rhymes with Orange in your favorite newspapers, our very own Hillary Price. All three of you were there to birth what has now become this iconic event 20 years ago. Let's start with you, Jen Derringer. Tell us about the Hot Chocolate Run for Safe Passage and where this idea came from. Thank you so much for having us, Monty. Um, so I was on the board of Safe Passage 20-plus uh, years ago, and every time you say that, I feel old. Um, and we uh, we needed money, and i not much of a fundraiser. Don't tell my development director at Community But they're going to be Lane. happy that I gave a shout-out to the yes. fact that you're fundraising for it right now. <laughs> Thank you. I am. Uh, and my husband, John Fry— Sealer of uh, Weights and Measures. Sealer of Weights and Measures. That's all one word— um, had a lot of experience doing uh, running race events, uh, some cycling events, some running events. And so we sort of came up with this idea of just having a small little fun run uh, in the fall. And then fall became December. And Carrie LeBounty, who another, could not be with us today, another one of your favorite people, yes. uh, came up with the idea of calling it the Hot Chocolate Run which led to endless gallons of hot chocolate being burned on our stove the first year. <laughs> uh, more on the details of the hot chocolate later. Um, we did now do it in a much more professional fashion. Professional fashion. A gigantic packet. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it takes 12 people it's, to rip it it's open. It's Swiss yeah. Mississippi. It is, it's that big. It is hermetically sealed, those packages of hot chocolate. <laughs> That's right. So that was, that was the beginnings of it. It became... It was originally the Mayor Higgins Hot Chocolate Run. Former mayor of Northampton. That's right. Lending a little name notoriety. That's right. To an Much beloved. Yeah, an yes. organization that maybe was flying under the radar to a certain degree at the time, perhaps, and needed the celebrity boost. The yes, mayor and she of was Northampton. happy to do it, and we were so happy to have her. And then the the, the finishing touch was that um, Hillary Price of Rhymes with Orange fame was happy to do our now iconic penguin and polar bear, uh, which we put on mugs because you have to put the hot chocolate somewhere, Monty. Right. <laughs> and that 
was kind of it, but I think Hillary wants to add something. Well, I mean, we're all, here's the thing. We're all sitting around the kitchen table at your guys' house. Me, Carrie, you, John. There were probably wine glasses. There were definitely <laughs> wine glasses. We're not going to say what they were filled with. Not hot chocolate. It was going to be the Merlot run. <laughs> passage, I think maybe cross purposes there slightly. <laughs> right, and we're trying to think of, like, what can we do, what we can do. I think Carrie was on the board at that time as well, maybe? Yes. Or, or yeah, yeah. And so um, things just started to get hatched, hot chocolate, race, like, and then no one ever says, oh, my God, we need a cartoonist. You know, so that, <laughs> Emergency cartoonist! Exactly. <laughs> Until that moment. Until that moment. Right. So um, it, it, was, it was amazing how kind of we all had different things to, to bring together. It's almost like the beginning of a Marvel movie or That's something like that. That's what I said. Like it's that. like this is the origin story. This, yeah. is, this is like Wolverine or something like that. Yeah. Oh, what did that first mug have on it? Because the designs have gotten more and more elaborate and interesting and, and just... There's so much going on on them. Yeah. So the original one, I mean, it had to fit uh, Mayor Claire Higgins hot chocolate run for safe passage. That's like, <laughs> you know, half the mug right there. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure. I mean, why why a penguin and a polar bear? Well, how do you talk about a subject that is not not that is hard, that is complex? Being domestic violence, which is what safe being, passage yes. deals with. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. That, um, you know, what what could we how could we talk about that visually? And so by getting two disparate characters um, and also I acknowledge penguins are from one side of the earth. Polar bears are from the other. <laughs> they meet on this one day and they all get along. Um, and no one tries to eat the other. Exactly. <laughs> Um, how, you know, how can you show people or, or two characters helping each other? And so even though there's lots of different th uh, different pictures of the mug over the over the many years, the theme behind it is cooperation, help, care. Um, and so originally it was just me doing the mug on my own, um, you know, with a Sharpie, every single one. No, just uh, <laughs> Those but, are worth a lot of money now, I bet. Do yeah. not put Original them in artwork. your dishwasher. Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, then then uh, Safe Passage, as as the event grew, there's, there's more people behind it. And so uh, we work with a designer, um, Seth Gregory is his name, who, who I have corresponded with a lot and could not pick him out of a crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, the, the drawings got... With his help, the drawings and the design became um, just more complex and richer as a result. Mm. That is Rhymes with Orange cartoonist Hillary Price, who lives right here in Western Massachusetts. We're also speaking with Jen Derringer and John Fry, who were part of the think tank that birthed this huge event that will happen this Sunday in Northampton, the 20th Hot Chocolate Run for Safe Passage. John Fry... As sealer and weights and of me, uh, of weights and measures, and who keeps track of numbers and things, yes. about how many people ran in the first hot chocolate run for Safe Passage twenty well, years ago? About twice as many as we were expecting on the day. Uh -huh. So <laughs> that made things a little challenging, <laughs> especially um, with making hot chocolate wait, on your stove. People just showed up and were like, "Hey, I'm here to run." Like I didn't register well, or anything. Right. I mean, we had day of registration, mm. but uh, we didn't expect that many people. So we were hoping for two hundred. Uh, we wound up with 450 between the walk and the run. Um, so. Because that's still an option. You don't have to run the 5K. You can right. walk a slightly shorter than 5K, right? Yes. Yes, 3K. Yeah. Sure. See, he's good with the weights and the measures. <laughs> and, and so 400 people show up. You're making hot chocolate for them literally on your stove for that yes. particular year. Yes. I think we we were – trying to make about 20 gallons and we probably ran a little short but <laughs> we definitely ran a little short <laughs> it was the eyedropper of hot chocolate run for safe yes. passage no mug at the time it's yes. like communion fortunately yeah. all the participants were very forgiving understanding <laughs> and and they all came back and it quickly grew from there quickly and exponentially how much money were you aiming to raise in that first year for the hot chocolate run for safe passage are oh, we allowed to say this number a, yeah fine. anything we're getting, we're getting clearance from our overhead <laughs> we did raise uh six thousand dollars that first year wow and we were so excited it's yes. an incredible feat mm -hmm. um maybe we, in a little bit we'll find out how much they raised last year on the hot chocolate run for safe but does anybody have that number handy natalie 
seven hundred and ninety two thousand dollars in 20 years that's is that like a hundred times growth uh at least yes. yeah a i don't even know how, i don't know how to do math yeah that's why john's here yeah right. he's the sealer of weights and measures and we are speaking with the people who have created the hot chocolate run for safe passage um i think what people maybe we should wait a little bit and come back with you and talk about where we're at now with this race how many people are doing the race now how the hot chocolate is given out to all that many people and maybe some of the goals that are, are we're trying to achieve this weekend at the hot chocolate run for safe passage yeah, let's do that but before uh, we'll take a little break and we'll talk about the work of safe passage with Catherine Hodes and Natalie Ulrich coming up in just a little bit. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. We are here talking about the Hot Chocolate Run for Safe Passage, which is, I believe, the largest community fundraising event in terms of scale of number of people participating and amount of money raised. It's happening this Sunday in Northampton for the 20th time. It's all to benefit Safe Passage. And joining us from Safe Path Passage is Catherine Hodes, who's the Director of Community Programs, and Natalie Ulrich, who's the Director of Development, which means money. For those who don't know, in the in the uh, speak of, of the five hundred one c threes, if you're in development, that means like money, and this is <laughs> undoubtedly the largest amount of money that is raised at, in one fell swoop for Safe Passage in the course of a year. Right, Natalie? Yes, absolutely. This is our largest fundraiser by far, um, and I agree with you. I don't know of any other local community nonprofits that raise more than this event in particular. Um, so it's definitely the largest in the valley that I know of. Catherine, tell us about a little bit about the mission of Safe Passage. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that we're raising this money for a reason. And Safe Passage's mission is to support survivors of domestic violence in becoming safer and more autonomous and being able to locate more options and choices than they tend to have when they're living through domestic violence. And at Safe Passage, we work through an empowerment lens, and we're there to support survivors to regain their personal power, uh, to increase their options, reduce isolation, and really take steps towards safety and autonomy. And we do that through a lot of different strategies and actions, including safety planning and various kinds of advocacy around legal needs and immigration remedies. Um, we do counseling work with survivors and support groups with survivors and their children to reduce fear and trauma and isolation. And all of these services are supported and enhanced by the funds that we're able to raise through the generosity of the community at the Hot Chocolate Run. Uh, you had to close one of your shelters um, in the past couple of years. How has that changed your approach to your mission and the things that you do within it? Yes, thank you for asking that, because I, I think it's really an important point in the way the field is developing um, and our understanding of the landscape of domestic violence and how it impacts people. So domestic violence, of course, intersects with a lot of other issues that people are facing, poverty, for example, racism, misogyny. And one of the things that makes it very difficult to regain safety is when the domestic violence has impacted your economic stability or your housing stability. And domestic violence shelters, which have existed and still exist across the country, originally were developed to, to serve an immediate need when a survivor needed to flee very quickly. But back in those days, you could flee, locate a shelter, and then from the shelter, maybe like somewhere in 30 days, or you would locate another apartment. Well, nowadays, that's virtually impossible. And people are shut out of housing that's affordable and safe. And so what we did was turn our attention to, I think, an area that's developing very quickly and is really important for survivors, which is economic empowerment, financial stability, um, and you know, really looking at issues around people's employment, the options they have to um, you know, have more control over their own safety and their own income. So we have turned our attention to um, developing housing options and supporting people not only in locating temporary housing, 
but being able to determine the best ways to locate more permanent safe housing. And that is done in a variety of ways. It's done through housing vouchers and housing programs. But we have two dedicated advocates now, actually three, dedicated advocates right now who are going to work with survivors around safe permanent housing. It doesn't happen overnight. We don't want to make anyone promises, <laughs> but it, it needs undivided attention. And that's what we're working towards at Safe Passage. That's what I remember reading about when the shelter closed, that the, the length of stay was getting longer and longer. It was just becoming untenable. We've just talked to the governor last week yep. about the housing crisis here. So all of these things are intersected. And yet, Catherine Hodes, who is the director of community programs for Safe Passage, there is, if somebody is in a domestic violence situation, there is a, a route through Safe Passage that can get them somewhere safe before that permanent safe housing yeah, is developed? Yeah, I mean, there are options and there have to be options for people because safe permanent housing isn't located in a day. It isn't right. located in a month necessarily. But it's important to understand that some of what survivors need is not always to locate themselves physically in some other place. They need a whole range of safety planning options. And that's always been true. And even when we, you know, uh, when before shelters, any shelters closed, we were often in a situation where the shelter beds were full. Mm -hmm. And there were lots and lots of survivors who weren't served by shelter programs. And we have always done robust safety planning, uh, various kinds of options through legal systems and educational systems and family networks and volunteers that have supported the safety of survivors who are not in a domestic violence shelter. And that is still true. We're still doing that. It's possible that somebody who's listening to this very conversation right now may be experiencing domestic violence in their lives. What do you say that to them hearing this conversation, what they should do if they want to reach out to Safe Passage and receive some of the services that everybody will be fundraising for on Sunday at the Hot Chocolate Run for Safe Passage? Well, they should definitely call our helpline, um, and I'll read that number off if that's okay. It's 413-586-5066. Again, that's 413-586-5066. A local number. Yes, local it's a local code. number. There is a national uh, yep. abuse hotline as well. And it but... is connected to our offices in Northampton. The helpline is open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. But if you call at any other time, please listen carefully to the, the message that you will hear because it gives you other options um, to call immediately for emergencies or other kinds of support. And th there are national domestic violence hotline numbers, and we can connect people to that on off hours. And calling us is the, the first way that, you know, of, of crossing the threshold into receiving support, advocacy, and assistance from Safe Passage. And we're there for you, and we want you to call us. About how many people do you think Safe Passage works with, may, let's say, in a month? Well, um, if we're or gonna... break it down any way you want. We could get the sealer of weights and measures here to figure out the best <laughs> right. mathematical I mean, way to do it again. But. That, that's always it. For someone who's not good at math, you like to invite it in. I know. <laughs> I like to hear about math. And, and like really, I'm, I'm absolutely terrible at math and I'm terrible <laughs> at counting numbers. So I don't do, uh, you know, a lot of the data work. But, I, you know, if you're going to count children, there are people that call us one time for assistance. And that's what they needed. We're not, you know, we're not imposing services on anybody. There are people that come repeatedly for a month, for a year. So there's a lot of traffic, you know, that is really according to the needs of the survivors. But I would say that in a month, my counseling team works with any, you know, can work easily be working with between 50 and 100 people. Wow. Having contact with 50 to 100 people in a month. I think like hunger, which we were talking quite a bit about the last couple of weeks, this is uh a situation that may be invisible to many people, but this is mm -hmm. a real and active situation. Domestic violence happening right now, and Safe Passage is there as part of uh, trying to bring people towards safety, bring people towards healing. That is Catherine Hodes, who's the director of community programs for Safe Passage. We're also joined by Natalie. Do you say Ulrich, like Lars Ulrich or Ulrich? What Ulrich. Do you like? Ulrich. Like Ulrich. Um, who is the director of development for Safe Passage? One thing, and I know that you're. Uh, how long have you been doing this for Safe Passage, Natalie? This is technically my third hot chocolate run season, but I started in November of 2021, so I was Ooh. very new that first year. John was still <laughs> what a on time board. To and join Sarah the Smith. organization, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is my second year of kind of being at the helm. One thing I've noticed, because I've been going to the hot chocolate run almost every year since it's been going for the last 20 years, is how um, much better the organization has got with the Hot Chocolate Run in incorporating the messaging about what Safe Passage 
is up to. Can you talk about what people might see and expect at the Hot Chocolate Run, the types of signs they'll be holding up and ways that the, costumes. the message, <laughs> the costumes is one great thing, but <laughs> the messaging of Safe Passage is also mission mission based and built into the this now really fun uh, community event. Absolutely. I think the Hot Chocolate Run really does represent this incredible combination of this fun, festive, the costumes, the, all of that um, community event that people love to come out and participate in. Um, while also reminding people of this incredibly important work and issue that's happening. And so it is a really important part of mine and my team's job to remind people of our mission as part of that work. Um, And even as Hillary was speaking to the, the design that goes into the mug, even though that might not be clear to everyone as they're seeing that, it's gone into so much every aspect of this event. Um, Some of the things that people will see, uh, we have stickers that get handed out by volunteers on the day of that say, I walk for, I'm running for. Um, Some of them have like pre-filled out reasons for safety, for for whatever. Uh, Some are, you can fill them in. So people put names. Lots of people walk in remembrance of folks. So you'll see that as well as the costumes uh, as people do the walk and run. Um, We also, let's see. You have uh, the hats. We have the red hats. Yeah. The red Not hats. Not those red hats. No. These are other red hats. Yeah. <laughs> Much warmer. <laughs> All across the board. Yeah. Warmer across the board. Yeah. Um, red hats are earned through our fundraising incentives. So uh, for someone who fundraises $150 or more, they get a red hat. And it's, it is truly incredible on race day to stand there and look out at the crowd and see how many people are wearing a red hat. Um, that say, you know, fun, I'm a fundraiser for hope. Um, and I think in general, just to like domestic violence is such an isolating experience for so many people. And so having this group of 6,000 participants plus however many um, spectators? spectators, thank you, mm-hmm. um, you know, are out in the crowd and to st- to like recognize, wow, this is, you know, this is a, an event that's supporting work for domestic violence. And as a survivor, you know, you're not alone and people care about this and we're here and we're, we support this and we fundraise for this and, and we care about you and um, we care about safety and we care about a better future for this community. Um, and that's really powerful. That's a really powerful moment uh, at the start of the event. We're speaking with Natalie Ulrich, who's the director of development for Safe Passage, and that was a little bit of a spoiler alert. But they, we talked to John Fry earlier about the first hot chocolate run for Safe Passage 20 years ago. They were hoping for 200, got 400. Is 6,000 the number of people that will be participating in this walk and run on Sunday? See, That's I'm not exaggerating, right. listener, when I say this is the biggest community fundraising event in our area for sure. Yeah, that's the hope. I mean, right now, I think we're right around 5,000, but we've seen kind of a delayed registration this year. People just aren't really ready to commit until something's right in front of them. And so I actually do think that we'll come pretty close to 6,000 people this year. Do you still have walk-up registration? Like people can show up the day of and decide to do not the um, the the timed races, but some of the other parts of the, the hot chocolate run? There are three timed races as part of the event. There's a 3K walk, there's a 5K fun run, and there's a 5K road race. Registration ahead of time is absolutely encouraged and if you look at any <laughs> if you look at any of my emails they will say day of registration is not available the reality wow. is that we hate to turn people away and so if someone really happens to have a friend in town or really couldn't get the registration done we can make that magic happen on day of but we absolutely encourage people to register ahead of time and hopefully fundraise I know that uh, Jen Derringer and John Fry, who we spoke to before, are are kind of retired from the day-to-day or the year-to-year operation of the organization of the event. They were making the original hot chocolate on their kitchen stove in Northampton. Hillary Price still designing the mugs for the end of the race, which we won't reveal the design this year. Or are you allowed to do that, Hillary Price? On radio, Monty? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. It's amazing. (laughs) Wow, look at that polar bear and that penguin doing that thing that I'm not going to say. It's nothing untoward. Uh, Natalie, the how is the hot chocolate done now? 
So we have an incredible partner in the Western Mass Food Processing Center up in Greenfield. They are such an amazing team. Liz Buxton and her team really just show up for us in so many ways. Um, But we basically get a bunch of ingredients donated. This year, the 400 gallons of milk are being donated by Hood. Um, And all of the dry ingredients, including cocoa, sugar, vanilla, I can't tell you exact amounts because that would reveal our secret recipe. Um, John Fry, sealer, wait to measure knows the exact amounts, I bet, though. Those are donated by Tarte, um, which is a part of Shelburne Falls Coffee now. Um, So those all get delivered up to Western Mass Food Processing Center, and Liz and her team arrive at like 3 a.m. on Sunday morning and in giant... I imagine it as vats, but yeah, like cauldrons (laughs) um, are mixing up that hot chocolate and they put them into these huge containers that come in a moving truck and then get (laughs) emptied into uh, Cambros and then they get emptied into mugs. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It is so delicious, too. It is really good hot chocolate. Yeah. I'm always surprised year to year because I'm not a big fan of like the uh, packet of mix of hot chocolate, but. You guys do this ain't spe- no package. This yeah, is not, this is real. Yeah, this is the this is the real deal. We're talking with the folks from Safe Passage who uh, are the beneficiaries of the hot chocolate run for Safe Passage, which is happening for the twentieth time, or is it the twenty first? I can never keep track it's the of the twentieth twentieth anniversary of the hot chocolate run this Sunday. Registration will remain open in advance until when, Natalie? Friday night at 9 p.m., which is also our fundraising deadline for fundraising oh. prizes for individuals and teams. And you would be shocked to see how like how individuals go out there and fundraise and and get that their community together to support the community of people who are experiencing domestic violence. Let's take a quick little break, and we will talk more with the uh, the originators the origin story of the hot chocolate run for safe passage thank you to uh, Catherine hose the director of community programs for safe passage and natalie ulrich the director of development uh more from the fabulous 413 on 88.5 nepm coming up Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. And we are here talking to the folks, three of the four folks, who created the hot chocolate run for Safe Passage, which is celebrating. a very different meatloaf song. That was? We had four folks. Oh, yeah, I see. (laughs) I thought you were talking about the song I was playing, which was by the band Hot Chocolate. I know. Of course, because we're talking about the hot chocolate run for Safe (laughs) Passage, which is this Sunday. John Fry, who happens to be the sealer of Weights and Measures for Northampton and the surrounding areas. Jen Derringer, who works for Community Legal Aid. And Hillary Price, Rhymes with Orange cartoonist, which I think, pound for pound, funniest comic in the newspaper. It's the only one that's still funny. It is the only one that so is true. still consistently funny. I don't want to, you know, it's. I'm sure the world of no comics shape, but... is no different than the world of newspapers and radio and mediums that aren't uh, necessarily the same way they were when maybe you started. But... Mm, for sure, for yeah. sure. <laughs> but thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, John Fry. Easy to tell the truth. <laughs> yes. Uh, John Fry, you have historically created the root for the hot chocolate run, but you have now retired from that. Who's who's now sh- creating re- the root? And is, I've are retired they... from that, but the root remains the same. Mm-hmm. Um, Tell very, us, a... very hilly, right? Very hilly. <laughs> yeah, there are people that talk about the the level of difficulty with this run. This is a real uh, run where you're timed. You get a badge. It can help you qualify for other runs, etc. <laughs> right. I guess you'd have to run very fast. <laughs> in theory, there's, there's in theory. some who do run it very fast. I've there been surprised by how quickly the road race, like the the lead people for the road yes. race, get to the finish yes, line. The stragglers have barely left the start line. Exactly, when the finishers are coming in. Yeah, and it's sure. usually a group of young people from some sort of running team, either locally or somewhere else in in the state. And we are uh, people are coming from all over the place to run this. All right. Maybe Natalie's nodding her head over there, development director. Yeah. Do, do you know where the furthest person from has registered? I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I do know that people come from out of state either because they maybe at one point went to school here and, and did the hot chocolate run and that was something that meant a lot to them or they have friends or family nearby. But yes, we absolutely get a lot of people from out of town who come in to do the race. When did it, is it Run 413 that teams up with you to do the times? Um, This year, we're partnered with The Last Mile Racing, which is a company out of Connecticut, 
and they do the timing for things like the Chicago Marathon. So we're really excited. This is a big yeah. deal. It's like it's this is it's a and I always go back to thinking about because I've known you both all all of the people here who have created the hot chocolate run for practically all of those twenty years, and thinking about it being in your kitchen, cooking hot chocolate on your stove. Hoping that 200 people will show up and being surprised that 400 people will show up and raising whatever amount of money to just help Safe Passage continue on to fast forward. Now it's like a three quarter of a million dollar fundraising event. Uh, Hillary Price, how does, how does that make you feel to, to watch the progression over these last 20 years of this into the stratosphere of a fundraising event locally? It makes me feel really proud. Um, it turns out that it's always uh, right around my birthday. <laughs> and so as people are cheering, I feel like they're cheering for me. Yes. I know I am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I, 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 I often, I've done both. Um, but when I'm running, I, I'm, I tend to be by myself because I'm slower than my peers. Um, and I just, I, I'm looking at all the people that are, st- that are along the road cheering and all the people that are in front of me, and I just feel very filled by the experience. Um, it, it, it's emotional. Jen Derringer, how does it make you feel? As somebody who was on the board of Safe Passage, it was uh, not an unknown organization, but maybe a, a much lesser known organization struggling to make uh, its ends meet to see how far it's come. It's really, I get I get choked up every year that I think about it. Um, We had no idea when we started what this was going to become. And kudos to Safe Passage for really embracing it. Um, And we have to mention Sarah Smith, who worked so closely with us for so many years to really build it up to the community event that it is. Um, And it's just an amazing thing to have so much community support and celebration and joy around such a difficult issue to think about and talk about and certainly to experience. And I just think that Safe Passage does a tremendous job of threading that needle and really um, giving the, the community is able to give back to Safe Passage and Safe Passage gives back to the community because this is really an opportunity to, to celebrate community and what that really means. It's, it's you, you, your march last year, last week, that was so incredibly successful and how hard you work on um, the this fundraisers that you do. This feels like in that category of something really special that's not just about it, it's about the the important work that Safe Passage does, but it's also about our community. It, it is. I mean, and I will say that I would not. I would. Not, I would be consumed with the burden of the march for the food bank if not consulting with uh, John John Fry and Jen Derringer about. You need to figure out how to to better spread out the workload of this thing. <laughs> it, it was a game changer in my approach to the march for the food bank. John Fry, Seal of Weights and Measures, who is one of the creators of the Hot Chocolate Run, it, that started with these maybe two hundred people. Now to uh, maybe six thousand people. How does it make you feel watching this it event grow? Makes me, I am so happy that I'm not getting up at four a.m. anymore to work on <laughs> yeah. it. You um, learned to pass it on. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. La- last year, Jen and I this that was our first chance to actually participate, and it just it felt great. It was and unbelievable. Hilly. Yeah, <laughs> and a little hilly, but <laughs> very hilly. You were regretting making but, that route while I, you were running yes. the route. I, I don't think I really appreciated it. it you know, I mean, working it on the event on for hill. 18 years. It, it um, starts on It hill. starts on an uphill, for sure. But <laughs> <laughs> And then it goes through that hill in, at Smith. Like It, it is, does, it does. But it's, These were your choices. It's, so, <laughs> it, it's such a beautiful course, though. And it's it a, a, a beautiful event to come check out. It is this Sunday in downtown Northampton. Things kick off around 8 or 9. Khalees will be there as a, what are you, DJing, MC? No, I'm hosting. Hosting apparently. the event. I've, you can still try to say witty things just like I do here, but for a better cause. <laughs> <laughs> and you can still register before uh, Friday night is when registration closes. The best place to can you find a link at safepass.org, Natalie Ulrich? Um, the be- best place to go is hotchocolaterun.com. Natalie Ulrich, who is the director of development. Catherine Hodes, the director of community programs. John Fry, sealer of weights and measures. Jen Derringer from Community Legal Aid. And Hillary Price, Rhymes with Orange cartoonists who are all behind this year's 20th Hot Chocolate Run for Safe Passage. Tomorrow on the Fabulous 413, 
Tis the season of giving and maybe making. It's Giving Tuesday. We'd love to hear about what organizations you're giving to. You can email us, thefab413 at nepm.org. Makers Markets are where it's at, and there's around the corner from my house, there's a building that's full of tiny local producers on Gasoline Alley. We're going to talk with the folks at Irvin Food Brood about their mission and making economic collaborations like that happen with the third annual, annual Kringle Market this weekend. We're also going to talk with Springfield native Bill Posley, who's a comedian and writer. He is behind... Cobra Kai and other great shows. This is Gene Knight who passed away today. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Kelly Smith. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413.